Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming to our Knowledge Thirsty Thursday. Uh, today's topic is the power of harm reduction in uh, recovery. Uh, my name is Chris McBain. I'm an education coordinator uh, here. And uh, with me today will also be Dr. Bonnie Larson. Um, she is uh, working at a uh, an, an emergency clinic at the moment, so she may have to pop in and out, but I'll just keep watching um, for her today. Um, so why don't we get started here? The chat should be uh, enabled. If you have questions, um, you're welcome to post them in the chat uh, as we uh, move through uh, the presentation this morning. Here we go. Yes, so as I said, my name is Chris McBain. I'm an education coordinator here, and I am a queer white settler on the Nitsitepi, the traditional territories of the Siksika, the Gainai, the Bikani, the Sutina, the Ahe Nakoda, and uh, Métis Region 3. And um, we, Safe Lake Alberta, is a small uh, nonprofit rooted in harm reduction. We serve a number of folks uh, all throughout Alberta. Um, we started in 1983 as an aid service organization, and uh, we have grown exponentially um, to uh, a lot more work. So supporting folks uh, of reproductive age and our program in um, Medicine Hat. Uh, we also um, support Indigenous communities, African, Caribbean, and Black communities, gay, bi, and men who have sex with men communities. And of course, we also support um, people who use substances as well. So that is us. So today we want to talk about um, the power of harm reduction uh, in recovery. In <clears throat> Addiction recovery and harm reduction are really hot in the press and politics these days. So in the field of addiction treatment, there's a big debate between harm reduction and addiction recovery. Harm reduction aims to reduce the negative effects of drug use without demanding complete abstinence. On the other hand, some addiction recovery emphasizes the need for complete abstinence as the end goal. So those in favor of harm reduction argue that reducing the negative effects of drug use uh, is a compassionate and practical approach that acknowledges the reality of addiction. And they claim that providing new needles or naloxone can save lives and decrease harm, even for people who aren't ready to commit to abstinence-based recovery. Meanwhile, supporters of addiction recovery stress that complete abstinence is the only reliable way to achieve long-term health and wellness. Um, they worry that harm reduction strategies might unintentionally enable drug use and addiction uh, by making people feel secure and letting them avoid the consequence of their actions. So it's a really complex and charged debate, um, uh, but both sides want to reduce harm of drug use and improve the lives of those who are affected by addiction. Ultimately, the best approach will vary based on uh, individual circumstances and mix of harm reduction and addiction recovery strategies may be the most effective option for some people. But it really, you know, the question I guess we're, we're playing with today is, is it harm reduction versus recovery or harm reduction and recovery? Uh, are they antithetical to each other? So before we kind of get cracking on that, I just want to um, uh, start with like a quick historical tour, uh, if you will. So in the 19th century, early 19th century, before the regulation of substances, um, it was a really profitable time for the makers of patent medicines. These were trademark products with secret formulas uh, and sold over the counter. And in, in time, high infant mortality and limited access to medical care. Um, so the children's market was particularly lucrative and several products with names such as Godfrey's Cordial or Mother's Quietness were widely available. Uh, but the most famous was Mrs. Winslow's Soothing Syrup. And it was introduced in 1845. It was claimed that it was a cure for teething pain and a number of other ills experienced by infants. And their advertising was actually really visually attractive uh, and it often pre presented sort of this idealistic domestic image of a mother and child and since the two primary ingredients of Mrs. Winslow's soothing syrup were morphine and alcohol it's not surprising that um, the syrup did relieve pain and diarrhea incidentally which is a common side effect of uh, opioids <clears throat> is constipation so the patent medicines were liberally used by hired nurses who cared for their children and working mothers and the overuse of these narcotics no doubt contributed to increased child mortality in factory towns.
pounds. So Mrs. Winslow's soothing syrup and others like it were denounced by uh, certain medical associations in 1911, um, but it wasn't completely withdrawn from sale until 1930. Then we also see there is this wide praising of the use of cocaine. Uh, Sigmund Freud was one of uh, many physicians who actually thought that this was a magical drug. Um, and many physicians actually advocated for its use for a wide range of medical issues. Um, cocaine was also prescribed early on to treat addiction to morphine, opium, and alcohol. Uh, and its use as an anesthetic is demonstrated by Carl Kohler for eye surgery. So even though the use of cocaine for pleasure rather than medicine purposes grows quickly, especially as pharmaceutical companies make cocaine uh, hydrochloride widely available. Uh, we also see uh, products often quoted are Coca-Cola. So Coca-Cola entered the scene in 1892 and uh, they established and advertised it as a remedy for headaches as well as a tonic for elderly people who are easily tired. Key ingredient, cocaine. So the soda became extremely successful. Then uh, Bayer, a German pharmaceutical company, introduced um, diacetyl morphine under the trade name of heroin, which is Greek for the word hero, and uh, it was a remedy for cough. And according to Bayer, this product was more effective than morphine or codeine suppressing coughs and was non-addictive morphine substitute. So both of these claims later turned out to be false. And by 1911, earlier claims about this, uh, its action on the drugs were challenged, and it was regarded as about as effective as codeine in relieving a cough. So about the same time, stories of its addictive potential were beginning to accumulate, and the doses used for cough suppression, very few patients were likely to become addicted. And since it was mostly used for cases of chronic lung disease, like uh, likely few patients attempted to withdraw. But because it was unregulated and available over the counter, many people, in particular young working class uh, Americans, sniffed, smoked, swallowed, and, and injected it to get high. So Diacetyl morphine had not been discovered by Bayer, though. It was discovered in 1874 by uh, C.R. Alder Wright. He was an English chemist, and he did this by boiling morphine and acid. So the process altered the molecule and produced sort of this semi-synthetic morphine derivative. Um, initial animal trials were not promising, and little attention was given to its potential therapeutic use at the time. So now we'll look at sort of the criminalization of um, substance use uh, and its historical roots. So in uh, 1878, uh, we saw the introduction of the Temperance Act, which allowed municipalities and counties to prohibit the sale of alcohol in retail outlets. So several groups helped facilitate and promote the temperance movement on a national level, such as the Women's Christian Temperance Union uh, and the Dominion Alliance for Total Suppression of Liquor Traffic. So this eventually led to the most profitable Provinces, except for Quebec, um, voting in favor of prohibition. In that same year, we saw the Indian Act come into play in 1878. So this made the sale of alcohol to Canada's Indigenous peoples illegal. Uh, it also made the consumption of alcohol illegal for Indigenous Canadians, unless they surrendered their Indigenous status. So you see this is a move towards the erasure of a people. Then uh, we start to see prohibition start to come uh, on the scene. So let's just back a bit. So, um, so prohibition was first enacted at the provincial level in Prince Edward Island in 1901. And then other provinces sort of cascaded and followed suit, but not until 1910 during the First World War. So prohibition was seen as a patriotic duty and a social sacrifice to help win the war. And the provincial prohibition laws varied, but in general, they, they closed legal drinking establishments and prohibited the sale of alcohol beverages, um, as well as the possession and consumption of alcohol. So then in 1908, we also see the Opium Act come into play. So the Opium Act of 1908 makes it an offense to import, manufacture, possess, or sell opium for non-medical reasons in Canada. So people uh, who are found in violation of this statute may be punished by incarceration of up to three years and or a fine of up to $1,000, which in that time was quite a bit of money. So the legislation was largely motivated by a desire to regulate Chinese residents of Canada. So after anti-Asian sentiment led to labor riots against Chinese and Japanese Japanese residents in Vancouver in 1907, uh, William Lyon Mackenzie King was appointed by Prime Minister Wilfrid Laurier to deal with the aftermath of the situation. So while King sorted out the claims for the damage that had been done um, to Asian businesses during the riots, he noted that one of the Chinese businesses claiming damages was an opium factory, uh, and he was shocked by the scope of the opium trade. So 
Laurier sent King on a world tour to figure out how to deal with um, surrounding immigration from Asia. And their solution was to make up some benevolent pretext, um, something like Asians cannot survive the cold and Canadian cold in winters. Um, <clears throat> and so when King returned to Ottawa, he proposed an opium law saying, we'll get some good out of this riot yet. So rather than addressing the labor disputes between white and Chinese workers, King shifted the problem to opium use by Asian foreigners. So the law was easily passed within a few weeks uh, and has sort of defined Canadian drug policy for a century, um, all deeply rooted in racism. So I'm going to bounce a little bit back and forth between um, American and Canadian sort of history. So the Harrison Act was packed, passed in uh, 1914 in the United States, and it effectively banned cocaine and opium, except for sort of the preparations containing small amounts of the drug. So the Harrison Act treats cocaine as an extremely dangerous drug, and it incorrectly labels it as a narcotic, and it becomes harder and more expensive to get leading to the underground market or informal economy. So in 1915, the Treasury Department enforced the bill. Uh, and in fact, it was originally designed as a revenue bill. Uh, and it required that physicians prescriptions for addicts uh, for opiates had to specify progressively decreasing doses. So in 1919, the Supreme Court case of Webb versus the United States, uh, a ruling was made that it's a violation for the Harrison Act for a physician to prescribe morphine to an addict for purposes other than attempting to cure the habit. So this is from 1914 to like 1935. So a mass prosecution of more than 25,000 physicians were indicted under the Harrison Act. That means that 3,000 were jailed, uh, 20,000 paid substantial fines, substantial fines. So this is really important to mention because this is where physicians stopped treating their addicted patients. And so here I'm going to show you um, some pictures of uh, early morphine clinics <clears throat> that were created between 1924 and 1935. Um, the last of the clinics closed. Um, there was a sort of a collapse of private treatment facilities. Uh, and we saw the, um, the increase of incarceration rates of addicts. So you can see sort of on the right hand side, there's a woman with her head poking her head through the window, getting her uh, daily dose. So now... This is, this is where things get scary, and we're starting to see maybe history potentially repeating itself. So um, the narcotic farms were started. So the, so the consequence of the Harrison Act and the criminalization of addiction um, included a drastic increase in the number of addicts being incarcerated in federal prisons. And, and so the wardens of the prisons were having trouble managing this new kind of criminal. And so as a result of all of this, in 1929, the Public Health Service was authorized to create facilities to, quote, confine and treat persons addicted to the use of habit-forming narcotic drugs. So it was public health run, but also a prison. Uh, and this is not much different from what happened in Canada. So in Canada, addiction has traditionally been treated as a legal issue um, within the criminal justice system, emphasizing punishment rather than social or medical interventions. So the concept of compulsory treatment emerged within this punitive framework. So the, you know, it, it, for like, we want to look firstly at, um, sort of the sociological history of compulsory treatment in the 20th century, and also explore sort of the, con the contemporary Canadian tools for compulsory treatment. So conditional sentencing and drug treatment courts are all part of this. So the innovations really reflect a unique Canadian approach to compulsory drug treatment, combining elements of punishment and therapy. Um, so historically, like from 1900 to 1925 was sort of the cracking down on non-Western drugs like opium, cocaine, and cannabis. And the motivation behind drug prohibition was primarily to maintain social control over certain classes and ethnic minorities rather than for health concerns. So addiction was framed as a criminal issue leading to the establishment of um, drug enforcement network, which advocated for stricter laws and harsh punishments. But there were some isolated attempts to incorporate elements of treatment into the state's response to drug misuse, um, but these efforts played a minor role. So in the 1950s, uh, we saw different groups uh, who started exploring ways to address addiction with law enforcement uh, officials pushing for mandatory treatment to keep addiction criminalized. So in 1955, the, the Special Senate Committee on Narcotics narcotic addiction uh, had diverse opinions on how to handle drug addiction and with some of them advocating for ongoing narcotic use and others suggesting long-term isolation from society. So coercion was seen as a necessary 
part of behavioral modification. And, and the committee recommended separating all addicts from society for treatment. So even though this happened, this recommendation was not implemented due to the division of you know, responsibility between federal and provincial governments. In 1958, a new justice minister proposed a plan for custody for treatment, um, but it never became a law. So in the early 1970s, provinces attempted to develop sort of legal frameworks for compuls compulsory addiction um, treatment, um, but these efforts again faced opposition and were declared unconstitutional. Unconstitutional. It was only in the late 1990s that measures combining punishment and treatment started to emerge, leading to the introduction of conditional sentencing as an alternative to incarceration. So this flexible tool sort of allowed for mandatory treatment and, and it's and it and it served its community in its own way, I guess. But so drug treatment courts were established um, sort of as an alternative to imprisonment and they combine therapeutic programming with strict control and requirements for um, drug offenders. So the effectiveness of conditional sentencing and drug treatment courts is still being evaluated with mixed results um, regarding retention rates and recidivism, um, but concerns have been raised about the fusion of therapy and punishment, um, potential violations of due process rights, uh, and the net widening effects of prosecuting more drug offenders. So more research is needed to understand the true effectiveness, I guess, of this, the sociological implications of this, of compulsory treatment methods in Canada, um, considering issues of client motivation and the impact of civil rights and liberties. <clears throat> but I wanna take a look very quickly too, before we get to our conversation with um, Dr. Larson, about what treatment for drug addiction has looked like in the past. So we had things like uh, serum ther therapies. This is in the early days in the narcotic farms. So, and which happened in Canada as well. So these were like where there was a raising of blisters on sort of the, the patient's abdomen or their thighs. And then uh, with a syringe, they would withdraw the fluid from the blisters and they would re-inject it into the attic when they were experiencing withdrawal symptoms. Uh, it's pretty gross. <laughs> and then there's also the bromide sleep treatments. This was basically an induced coma. Um, it had a 20% fatality rate. So that's one in five people died. Um, they had other kinds of aversion therapies too, like, um, I can never pronounce this right, a succinylokine choline. Anyway, it created the experience of suffocating um, and the apomorphine, and it induced sort of a nausea um, that, that, that wasn't great. Um, we also saw sterilization or eugenics for people um, uh, who were quote unquote addicts. Um, insulin therapy. So this again is like getting people into a coma state um, and electric shock therapy, and then ultimately um, lobotomies. So <clears throat> none of these were successful in their treatment of addiction. Um, and uh, and so, so looking at recovery kind of thing, what has come on the scene, there, <clears throat> there becomes this new sort of movement of peer-led groups that are sort of helping people navigate their recovery. And in the 1920s, we saw sort of the Oxford group. This is a precursor to Alcoholics Anonymous. It was a spiritual, um, religious-based program. It was not necessarily for alcohol. It was for all kinds of things. Um, but um, members of that group um, left because they wanted to focus more specifically on, on the issue of alcoholism. And this is, of course, Bill W. and Dr. Robert Smith, also known as Dr. Bob. So this is in 1935 that AA starts up, becomes wildly successful. Of course, I mean, I guess if you're given the options, right, what would be better? And then in uh, 1953, Narcotics Anonymous sprung out of Alcoholics Anonymous because alcoholics didn't want to be associated with people who do drugs. And so they broke off and created their own thing, still based on 12 steps, still spiritual based um, um, recovery models. So <clears throat> in 1986, we saw uh, rational recovery come on the scene. This was an alternative approach to addiction recovery, uh, and it sort of diverged from the 12-step model. So it was founded in 1986 by Jack Trimpey. He was a clinical social worker, and um, it just emphasizes reliance on personal responsibility and the concepts of addictive voice recognition technique. Um, it's, it's a technique that uh, teaches individuals to identify and overcome the inner voice that perpetuates addictive behaviors. So Rational recovery emphasizes the power of personal choice and self-control in achieving and maintaining sobriety. 
We also saw uh, women for sobriety. This is in 1988, same sort of thing, but by women for women. And then we saw um, moderation management in 1994. Uh, this was for exactly what it sounds like, moderating uh, usage. Um, and uh, it was met with some success, though they don't necessarily um, advocate for the really, I don't know how to say this, but the, the, the hard addict kind of thing. It was more for just moderate, for moderation use. It wasn't necessarily for those who were compulsively drawn to substances. Um, and then Celebrate Recovery came on the scene in 1990s. And this was, again, a Christian-based recovery program that just addressed all kinds of issues, um, addiction, codependency, emotional struggles, all that sort of thing. Um, it, it, it's sort of based on the 12-step model as well. But then we start to see other really interesting things come on the scene like smart recovery. So this is a self-management and recovery training, and it's a secular science-based organization that provides support and tools for individuals seeking recovery from addictive behaviors. Um, it was founded in 1984 by Joe Gerstein, and he was a clinical psychologist. Uh, and this was sort of an alternative to traditional 12-step programs. So smart recovery is based on the principle of cognitive behavioral therapy uh, and motivational interviewing, offering sort of a practice practical evidence-based approach to addiction recovery. Uh, abstinence is not required uh, in smart recovery. There, there is a piece of moderation to that as well. Um, dual uh, recovery anonymous also came up. This was for um, persons who um, identify as addicts and also have uh, a mental health diagnosis that they're trying to navigate with. And then finally, in uh, 2014, we saw Refuge Recovery come on the scene. And this was a Buddhist-inspired addiction recovery program that was founded in 2014 by Noah Levine, um, who's an author and Buddhist teacher. It's since morphed into Dharma Recovery, is what it's called. But the program integrates Buddhist philosophy in a secular way, uh, mindfulness practices and meditation techniques to sort of support individuals in overcoming addiction and cultivating sort of a healing path and well-being. So Refuge Recovery really focused on developing self-awareness, compassion, uh, and insight as key components of recovery. So it provides meetings, literature, and online resources uh, and support for individuals in their journey uh, toward freedom from addiction. What's really interesting about it is that it's emphasizing um, sort of neuroplasticity, which I guess in in Buddhist traditions has been taught for 2000 years. And this is something that we're saying is, is new stuff, new interesting stuff. So this is, now we also wanna introduce harm reduction. So harm reduction, how does it fit into all this? And we'll have a conversation in just one minute with Dr. Larson about this, but harm reduction came on the scene uh, in the 1980s. Uh, it started in the UK um, as, as a response to sort of the heroin crisis. And it was adopted in Canada as a public health approach. Uh, and um, it was meant to prevent the spread of STBBIs uh, and, and overdose, de overdose deaths. So we really did see a lot of success. We do see success with harm reduction uh, when uh, needle exchanges were introduced, um, HIV rates among people who use drugs intravenously dropped by 73%, uh, access to care increased, uh, access to uh, social and medical supports increased. So, uh, but now we come to the sort of, uh, hot topic at hand, which is about whether or not um, harm reduction and recovery are sort of antithetical to each other. Uh, and I'm just trying to check and see uh, where if Bonnie is here yet. I don't see her. Oh, Bonnie, there you are. Hi. Just one sec. Where did that go? There you are. Promote to panelist. There, that should be good. So I'm really excited today to have um, Dr. Bonnie Larson here. Um, Dr. Larson uh, 
or is known as also Dr. Bonnie uh, in the inner city, uh, is a family doctor who's happiest accompanying patients at the highest risk of poor health outcomes. So she currently practices with Alberta Indigenous Virtual Care. Um, Tuesdays, you'll find her to wear his ReConnect program alongside community paramedics uh, for foot and wound care focused on primary care clinic. Uh, as a, she's also a faculty lead uh, for Street CCRED Collaborative uh, at the O'Brien Institute for Public Health. Um, Dr. Bonnie works for uh, to catalyze community-driven health equity initiatives uh, and associated research. So she works closely with people with lived experience of income and housing insecurity, um, as well as people who use drugs. And she serves on boards of directors of, of for AWARE as well. Um, so many things. She's an advocate and strives to educate, raise awareness, and promote social change. Um, and you can find her on Twitter, Twitter uh, at, uh, at Bonnie Ray Larson. Um, Bonnie, how are you this morning? If you can. Hi. Hi. Welcome. Doing okay. Can you see me? I can't tell. I can oh. see you. Yeah. Okay. You bet. Out in the sun. Hey, everybody. <laughs> yeah. I'm so I don't here. know how much did you catch of that? Did you catch the whole do or? I, I caught about the last, uh, I think I logged on about 10 after. So I think I caught quite a bit of the history and, and theoretical stuff that you talked about, Chris. Yeah. That's great. Um, super interesting stuff. Yeah. What, what do you, so what do you think about, uh, what, what does harm reduction mean to you? Let's ask you what that is. <laughs> okay. Um, what does harm reduction mean to me? Uh, it means exactly um, sort of what I'm, what I'm doing today, which if I kind of go like this, I don't know how much you can, you can see, but so we're down at the riverfront um, area, just downtown. Um, setting up a, a, an overdose prevention tent. Um, it's a cooling tent, like as in, you know, we've got extreme weather and we're just reaching out to folks uh, on a volunteer basis, you know, to just uh, support some of the stuff that's going on for, for everybody these days, including the drug poisoning crisis, um, the extreme weather. Uh, we've got water and, and masks, like, if folks want masks and snacks and things like that. Um, the idea being to show of solidarity and support for people who are using the facilities at the DI. It's just getting so overwhelmed. There have been a lot of um, drug poisonings and overdose. Some of the, the most um, intensive uh, numbers of EMS calls for overdose over the last, um, over the last few few weeks, actually, that we've ever seen. And so harm, what does harm reduction mean to me? It means like showing up uh, in my community to support my patients. I'm a doctor, so I say, uh, I'll say patients, um, but it's just, it's, it's our community. Uh, and it's the folks that are out here surviving every day. I just very much um, am here to support people where they're at. <laughs> just saying bye to some people. Um, in, in a very sort of practical, low threshold, low barrier, as barrier free as possible um, way. People are already out here and this is happening and the drug poisoning crisis is happening. So it's almost like in medicine, we talk about secondary prevention. It's like, it's already happen happening. If you already have diabetes, if you already have heart disease, then what we do after that is secondary prevention where we'll like put you on medication because to, you know, lower your cholesterol so you don't have another heart attack. And he, so for, I think of harm reduction that way from a, in my, with my medical hat on, um, from a philosophical point of view though, harm reduction to me is very much a community-based movement that's driven by the people that are most affected by whatever um, crisis or uh, situation or circumstance is, um, is going on at the time. Uh, and so harm reduction is a way to show up uh, on behalf of um, those folks in those situations that are already struggling to survive um, and doing what we can to uh, support them or make things um, a little bit less difficult. And that's really what it's meant. I think it's been, the, the term harm reduction has very much been co-opted and politicized over well forever actually 
um, because it, it's, a, it's an easy tar target for ideology, I would say. And so it gets politically used um, and appropriated for uh, political agendas rather than just what it is, which is just being out here helping folks out as supporting the front line. Yeah. You know, you talked about sort of responding to the, the poisonings. And I think we know now that one person is dying of poisoning every, is it 45 minutes, I think. Um, and, and so, and so it seems that the response is, let's just get people to treatment. Let's, let's force them into recovery. And what are your thoughts about this sort of idea of, you know, First of all, what is your thought on harm reduction being antithetical to recovery? And also, what do you think about this idea of forced treatment? I mean, I've talked about this sort of historical piece repeating itself again, but like, I'm interested in your thoughts on, on that. Yeah, absolutely. I won't, I won't go over that again in terms of like the history and why did we include harm reduction as a public health approach to begin with? Like when Health Canada adopted that, brought it in um, very much for the like re reducing STBBIs like HIV and hepatitis C. Um, and it became a very, a pillar, sort of one of the four pillars of uh, substance use treatment for folks who have substance use disorders. Um, so in a spectrum of care and intervention for folks who are um, uh, looking for, for that, for intervention in their substance use. And, and so it's always been very much part of the spectrum of care. Um, and, and one of the, if you think about a four-legged stool, um, traditionally one of those four legs, which includes things like treatment and recovery. And the other one, of course, is law enforcement. Um, and that is the whole piece about the war on drugs and why is law enforcement so much a part of um, substance use disorders. It's a big conversation. Uh, but at the end of the day, I guess I would make it easy and, and not beat around the bush in terms of my own opinions on that. It, it has never made sense to me that uh, we criminalize things that make people sick um, and, 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 and choices that everybody has that we zone in on in a discriminatory way on groups, whole gr groups of people um, for ideological reasons that actually have a basis in uh, a war against particular groups of people, including um, like it's, it's has racist roots. Um, and anti-Indigenous uh, roots. So to me, um, that, that those are parts of the, part of the reason that harm reduction has been co-opted and, and so deeply moralized so that it can be used against groups of people. And so, and like, you know, so this notion of like forced treatment, just might be another way of policing again racialized groups like we know that members from BIPOC communities are overrepresented in prison, especially in related to um, drug drugs drugs in some way. Um, so so it might just be another sort of avenue to sort of over police people. But what do you think about this this forced treatment? This you know I think the government made an announcement three days ago that you know if this current government is reelected, they will enact. Um, uh, what they think they call it involuntary <laughs> treatment. So what do you think about that? Like, is there, is like, you, so I'm certain, I'm certain you've worked with a number of people with substance use disorder, right? And like, do you like, do you see this yeah. as having any benefit at all or? So first of all, I would say that I think that it doesn't have any benefit. And I think that it's very harmful to people who use drugs. Um, I think that is, it, it is actually very harmful. As a physician, we already have mechanisms and laws in place where a person's um, free will or autonomy can be put behind or prioritized behind their, their health or if there's a risk of um, harm to them or to somebody else. We already have that power as physicians in the Mental Health Act to be able to put somebody on what's called a form one. Uh, and I have to say that uh, like as a physician who does outreach to the streets 
um, and works very closely with some of the outreach groups and uh, community paramedics, some of the groups that see folks in very dire circumstances that, um, yes, I have put folks on a form one and taken their uh, autonomy away in order for them to be transported and seen by a psychiatrist at a hospital. And that takes their autonomy away. And I can say that there is, there is no harder work and harder decisions um, that have to be made in that context than what has to happen um, than the decisions that I have to make in those moments uh, for what I would deem as um, the person's overall uh, wellness. So it is not something to be taken lightly by any stretch of the imagination. Um, I have done it for folks in mental health crisis. Say, for example, somebody with um, schizophrenia who's gone off their medications and they are... Uh, you know, having thought disorder, delusions, psychosis, things like that, and, and they're in trouble, you know, folks sometimes don't take care of themselves in that situation, they might get severe frostbite or be at risk of hypothermia, they're outside, they're not thinking um, about getting themselves into safety. And I, those are some cases, like some, that's, that would be an example of when I have put somebody on a form one, and had them convey to hospital involuntarily. Um, but what, what this government is, is proposing to do is unprecedented. It's giving lots of other people, including law enforcement officers, an additional role to play in um, putting, just for the simple reason of using substances, giving them the right to take somebody's autonomy away. And whether or not this government pushes law that will make that legal, it is still not ethical um, to do that. And it also, uh, so obviously like this is my population that I care deeply about. Um, but I also really question putting that responsibility on frontline law enforcement officers, um, and other, and family as well, who may think that it's the right thing to do. And, you know, they're in desperation. They, they, and families can already do that. They can go before a judge, um, and petition a judge to have their loved one's autonomy taken away um, it, if they want to make a case for that. It's not, there is a mechanism for that already for anybody to, and for police officers also to uh, take somebody's autonomy away to have them um, medically assessed. It's just like, like so many things, like what is considered to be normal and what is normalized? And with this law, it actually doesn't legally change a whole lot. Like the mechanisms are in place, but what it does is normalizes the concept that if somebody is using substances, that's a reason to take their freedom away. Um, and to me, that's where the ethical line and the constitutional line is very much crossed. I think what will happen if this goes through is that there will be constitutional law uh, challenges um, uh, against it. But like so many other things with this government over the last four years, the harm that can happen can happen while those processes, those legal processes are being um, executed, right? So no, I'm very yeah, much against it. <laughs> I wonder too, like what what is the probability of combining sort of punitive systems with therapeutic systems those two things to me seem antithetical but I don't know like can people find sort of like any kind of healing in that system I don't I doubt it you know Christopher it used to be thought that there was some research um like when I was training there was some research that came out that suggested that it didn't matter how people got to treatment whether it was voluntary or involuntary that the outcomes were the same like you know it, and so that's what I was taught when I was training was that you know it doesn't matter how they get to treatment um, their chances of recovery are the same but two things about that one is that 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 research has now been um, refuted and we have better evidence now that that's actually not the case that folks who are forced mandated to treatment do not do as well um, but the other thing is that 
uh, putting somebody, I think what a lot of folks are in the era of fentanyl, putting folks into involuntary treatment and abstinence is not only like unethical because they, unless they are choosing that, but it's actually far more dangerous because of loss of tolerance and the toxic drug supply. So that when you're forcing somebody to lose their tolerance, and this goes with, this isn't new. This is something that happens already with the, like you're talking about this confluence of um, sort of carceral approach to substance use uh, and putting people into uh, forced detox then they come back out onto the street in the, into the poison drug supply um, and they're not, they don't have any tolerance and they far more easily overdose and are at risk of death because of that. And I think often families don't realize that. They don't know that part. Um, they just think in desperation, okay, they just need to stop using. They need to just stop. Because that's the instinct when you have a loved one that's in dire straits like that. But the truth is that uh, in the era of fentanyl and high, high opioid tolerance, it actually is far uh, more dangerous to to quit. So what do you think about, so I know a lot of people sort of in sort of far right recovery sort of circles will say you can't get over drugs with drugs but what do you like like what is it that that helps people move through I don't even I don't even like the word problematic substance use but mm -hmm. you know like what, whatever like what what is it that helps people move through are OETs successful is hydromorphone a good idea is safe supply a good idea is it not like it like there's a lot of sort of these false facts coming <laughs> out and I, and I and I'm curious what is the medical truth about recovery and um these assisted therapies great question yeah so um generally speaking I would say that the more options people have the better because everybody is different and so yeah we need to have a way a language to talk about um to have discussions like this dialogue. Uh, but for me as a clinician, when, I, when I'm thinking about these things is in direct relationship with a patient. And so how do they define recovery? What does wellness overall look like to them? And if I have options, like if I have access to a whole lot of different modalities, treatments, interventions, models, care delivery models, the more variety I have to draw on, the better chances that I'll be able to meet that individual's need. Now, so that's on an individual sort of one-on-one -on -one basis. On a population level, we have very good um, research and evidence that supports a lot of harm reduction interventions. So supervised consumption services um, and uh, things like um, you know, injectable OAT and safe supply, also a de decriminalization models. And so like policy related stuff from a medical point of view, OAT is very good. It's better than um, abstinence-based recovery al alone. It's better than counseling alone or sort of recovery program alone. If what I counsel patients often is that if you're going to do one or the other, like say, for example, and this happens all too often, somebody's trying to decide between the two because they want to go to a treatment program, but it's an abstinence-based treatment program and that won't, uh, maybe won't accept them taking the medications that they're on, whether it's methadone or whatever it may be, may be um, we'll have to make a decision between uh, treatment and going to a recovery program they are safer to stay on their OAT, their opioid agonist treatment, or you know, their methadone or suboxone, than they are to stop that medication and go to the treatment program. We Why? actually don't, because there, there, um, there, there is, we don't have good evidence that treatment programs alone um, are, are effective. And it, that may come as a surprise, but the truth is that uh, these programs have for many years been unregulated, um, sort of anybody can hang up a shingle and say they're a treatment program, but there hasn't been a rigorous, uh, registration or quality, quality assurance, um, mechanism. 
And so, so we actually don't have good evidence around any of the treatment programs, including abstinence-based treatment. But what we know about abstinence-based treatment is that if folks with opioid use disorder go and they stop their opioid and their opioid agonist treatment, they, they are at high risk of um, a bad outcome after that, in part because, because when they relapse, if and when they relapse um, or use in the facility, they're at high risk of dying from an overdose. And so that's why I will explain that to folks and so that they understand that if they stop using um, their opioid agonist treatment, that they are losing their tolerance and they're gonna be at higher risk uh, if and when they, they relapse and use um, illicit substances. This is why we need more like safe supply uh, and, and to be not um, stigmatizing. The, the most severe form of stigma in our society that we can apply to people is criminalization, right? That's what makes people hide and use by themselves. And they're, they're at such high risk. It's such a risky proposition. Um, yeah, I'll be honest. Does that answer what, the question? It does. Yeah. yeah, very well. Like when I was in treatment, one of my friends, uh, we, we had gone through months together and he used one night and he overdosed in the bathtub above me. And another friend, uh, when we got out of treatment, you know, three days later, overdosed and died in his um, bedroom by himself. Right. right. right? So I, I yeah. definitely see those pieces. Yeah. And, and I'm so, so like, sorry. It's terrible. Yeah, it is. I mean, and I, my count is now eight friends buried, but um, the, and that's just people that I know. And so like one of the things too, that I, I find really interesting is that like, there's all this talk about treatment, but there's no talk about what happens after, like there's no addressing of the greater social determinants of health, right? Housing, food, employment, you know, I've got a criminal record. How am I going to get a job and have a meaningful life? Like, what do you think? Like, do you think that like this massive investment into treatments should be sort of reallocated? How would you allocate all the money? What would you do? <laughs> well, first of all, I would say something about the smoke and mirrors. Um, creation of beds in the recovery, um, recovery, so-called recovery oriented system of care, um, which is an anti-harm reduction system of care, actually. Like we're all for recovery. Nobody's against people getting better as those folks define getting better themselves. It's what they want uh, for themselves, not what sort of like somebody is paternalistically telling them is good for them. Um, so the, the, it can be kind of like framed, you can say like, oh, we created all these beds with all this money, but the beds don't actually exist physically. They may not actually physically exist. So I don't know if y'all have noticed, but it's no easier to get folks into a treatment program or detox. There's no new detox um, than it ever was. It's not... There is no, like, where, er, lots of people think, like, well, where are these be beds? And even patients are like, are you guys hiding something from us? Like, where, the government said there's all these new beds. It's because funding doesn't actually translate to beds. They have just a formula. It's a mathematical formula. Uh, but really, it's about, um, you know, funding, uh, funding certain organizations to be able to potentially cre create spaces um, for people coming in, but it doesn't mean those spaces actually exist, if that makes sense. Like, it is no easier to get folks into detox and treatment than it, than it ever has been. Um, and so, okay, well, if I had all the money, I would inject it upstream. So I think that affordable housing is, a, is probably our biggest problem, that you got to do affordable housing at the same time as making sure people survive. And so affordable housing and harm reduction um, is, and then the specialty piece would be permanent supportive housing that is housing first oriented. And for the folks that need the support in housing, that's what they have. I, I would take treatment, honestly, this is not, um, it's because of there's no evidence. I would take treatment completely out of it. I would you know, we, we need some way to make sure that people's needs are met, but 
I often see people, and I don't know if that's, I'm biased because of the, the community that I work in and the, the population that I have, but I know that there are people that, you know, need to go to traditional um, treatment programs. They think that they need that and then they go and then they get better. Absolutely. I also know a lot of people that go to treatment because they need a break from the streets. Um, or they just got evicted, or they don't have anywhere to go. And, and I completely support that. But I would far rather see them be in a housing first program with health supports around them with the wraparound supports, but housing first and give people the basics um, first, like all these fancy, fancy wellness communities, whatever, like if that's not permanent housing, then I don't, I don't want it. Um, I think that money should be invested in supportive housing. That's great. I'm going to I'm going to ask you one more question. I'm just going to let everybody know who's um, attending the webinar now. You can ask questions in the Q&A. They just come directly to me. So if you have any questions that you want to ask Bonnie, just pop it in. I'm getting I'm getting all of your chats saying the chat's disabled, but it's not. I, only I can see it. Um, but I wanted to ask you, Bonnie, it, um, let's uh, say well, let's do a choose your own adventure and i want you to kind of paint a picture for us about what uh addiction harm reduction recovery is going to look like depending on how this election goes if it goes this way what is this landscape going to look like if it goes this way what's this landscape going to look like if you if you could ha if you had a crystal ball what would you see you know, I was never, um, I've always been an activist, like a social justice activist, but I've never been political or I've never been partisan or even very political until I had to be because this government started taking things away that we really desperately needed. And so like for me, I'm not partisan. I, I would never vote conservative. I never have in my life, but it's not a, it's not a partisan um, issue. Generally speaking, although we're in extreme, this current government is extremely anti-harm reduction. And so I would say that like a change of government, if we continue on this path, things are looking very bleak. If we have a change of government, then we have a hell of a lot of work to do in order to undo a lot of the damage that the UCP has done and to rebuild in a good way, in a way that, um, you know, orients towards the, the, the affordable housing, permanent supportive housing, and supports the people that are actually doing the work, that have been doing the work despite COVID and the UCP over the last four years to, to but we need to guide that that if the UCP doesn't win, the NDP will win. And if, uh, but I do not feel confident that they know what to do. We have to tell them what to do. So if they win, I think what, what I would love to see is voices getting really loud from the front line. I know everybody is really tired. I can't believe the volunteers that have showed up today um, to do this amazingly uh, this is just awesome what's happening down here. Come join us if you want to. Um, hey, hey, Bonnie, somebody's asking in the chat, where do you see a really good model? Uh, what other province is doing this well, or even globally, where do you see this, this kind of stuff going well? Yeah, well, folks always talk about Portugal. And the thing that's good about Portugal is the principle of decriminalization. Um, but I don't know that it has been done Right. But the principle is combining decriminalization with safe supply because the, and that will get at the drug poisoning um, crisis and the mortality. And the reason is that you need the combination of the two things done properly, not just half assed. And I think some of what's happening in BC is the right idea, but it's not, it's not to the scale that it needs to be. Like the thresholds for, um, decriminalizing small amounts like for possession is too low so you need to have a much higher threshold and that's that's determined by people who use drugs and involving the voices of the folks that are most affected um, combining that with a real uh, safe supply and that doesn't mean prescribed safe supply I think that that's part of it but Part of it is also allowing for things like compassion clubs and 
um, community-based uh, resourcing and sourcing of drugs that are um, that are known that you know we know what they are. So that to me is the ideal scenario for addressing the drug poisoning um, the drug poisoning crisis. As for addictions, which is a separate but related issue, we need to be investing in primary care and making sure that the care providers who have been doing this work, programs like ARCH at the Peter Lougheed and at the Royal Alex in Edmonton, harm reduction in hospital, getting back to the things that we were working on before pre-UCP, like harm reduction in hospital, prevention of discharge to the streets, better support, um, better inclusive social medicine and health supports for folks. So on the addiction side, getting rid of the assumption that addictions doctors are the people that need to be involved with this. It's not, it's primary care nurses, nurse practitioners, some of the physicians that have been doing this work for a long time. So that to me would be um, my pie in the sky. That is awesome. Somebody in the chat said that you are the answer, <laughs> Dr. Pons. <Bonds. laughs> and so is whoever said that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's are. right. That's right. right? Um, we're going to wrap it up because we're coming to the end of our time. Um, just uh, before you go, I want to let everybody know if they scan this QR code that they're seeing on their screen to fill in our survey, let us know what you thought. Uh, we love your feedback. Surveys are currency in the nonprofit world. It's how we let our funders know what's going on. Um, but before we go, Bonnie, like, is there any Thing, any any last word on your soapbox that you'd like to share with us about this? Yeah. For, um, I would like to say thank you for the soapbox. Yeah, it's nice to have. I feel very honored and privileged to be part of this community. Um, and really, at the end of, end of the day, this is what I've said to folks coming out to volunteer today too: is that we're at the end of a really long stretch that's been really fucking hard, and you are all doing the work but you must take care of yourselves first um, because if you're not well and around to do the work, then nobody, no, there's nobody else. So please everybody stay safe and take really good care of yourselves. Amazing. Thank you, Dr. Bonnie. We love you. Thanks everybody for joining us today for our Knowledge Thirsty Thursday. If you want to see this, the recording will be on our YouTube channel and it's also going to be on our website under training resources. Uh, we would love your feedback there. Uh, share with all of your friends. Uh, thank you again very much for coming today. Take care. <laughs>